Hello and welcome to Mini Evangelism, the driver's seat where we talk about the Bible without the kids in the car. If the kids are in the car right now, please get off of this podcast and let them listen to something else. This is for adults only. In today's episode, we're talking about the parable of the lost sheep and the lost coin. And we look forward to talking about shitty shepherds and <laughs> petty pastors and Drew's self-righteousness i don't know about that it is there <laughs> we're glad you're here welcome aboard <laughs> hello and welcome to mini evangelism in the driver's seat where we talk about the bible without the kids in the car today the subject is the parables of the lost sheep and the lost coin yeah yeah Two and one. You're getting a two for today, folks. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, so, Anna, uh, what version of this story did you inherit? Um. So this, this I'm about to say something very rare. Mm -hmm. I don't remember this story. Mm. Like that was not told to me by vegetables. Yeah. It was not told to me in really VHS. bad eighties VHS tapes. <laughs> I don't remember being told this story, but yet. Somehow I know the story. Yeah. Like, is there a song about like he left the 99 to come find me or something like that? Yeah, there's like, I think there's a contemporary worship song about that. Yeah. And yeah. so I think that's kind of where like my introduction to the story and like widows and coins like are a big thing in the Bible too. So right. I don't know like how much of it, like how much of my memory of the story is like this particular story or yeah. if it's like another story with widows and coins. Well, and like fun fact, it's actually a triptych. It's actually three parables together, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the parable of the prodigal son or the lost son oh. that come together. So, but we're choosing to do just the first two because the parable is a whole vibe. The, yes. the parable of the prodigal son is a whole vibe that we'll do a different time. Yes. Uh, and, but it, it comes in, it comes in threes in the story. Right. Uh, and I imagine that if a church were wanting to share that story, they probably left off the sheep and the coin and went right for the prodigal son. Right. And just full disclosure to our listeners, we also chose not to do the prodigal son because in the first five episodes, we did two episodes about brothers yeah. that just – couldn't hang and we didn't want our brothers to think that we were like holding something <laughs> against them <laughs> so austin and jake we're good yeah <laughs> we're not mad at you yeah you dodge this one onto the sheep yes <laughs> and yeah. the coins I think how about you what did how'd you i in my mind i can see illustrations so it must have been an illustrated bible or something that mm -hmm. included these stories because i can i can see uh i could definitely see a shepherd like going after a sheep with the 99 in the background. I feel like I've seen that illustration and I can see a woman like peeking under a carpet looking for a coin. Right. I can see that illustration. Uh, I also think like, because in the gospel of John, there's this long passage where Jesus talks about himself as the good shepherd. Mm. Uh, this, this pair, the sheep parable lives with that one in my mind too. And again, fun fact, some of the earliest depictions of Jesus post resurrection in terms of like church art or catacombs art is Jesus as the good shepherd with a sheep over his shoulders. Yes. Uh, you know, the shepherd bringing home the lost sheep that it's one of the earliest images that really captured the early church and became part of their iconography, part of what they, they painted. So all of that kind of lives together in my mind. I think that the lost coin is probably the one that gets short of shrift uh, and doesn't get talked about as much yeah. because uh, there's a whole bunch of other shepherd and sheep content. And then the prodigal son is uh, just kind of pretty central in uh, Christian allegory uh, right. and gets used a lot. Um, but I like these two because they're they're simple enough that children can, pre can pretty much pick them up pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, the challenge is like they're metaphorical too, and children don't necessarily – do metaphor right. <laughs> until a certain <laughs> age. Uh, so that made the conversation a little bit tricky. Um, but uh, but I think that the, you can get an, an emotional response to um, even just the feeling of losing something and then finding it or being yeah. lost and then being found. Yes. And in the children's Bibles that we have at our church, the lost sheep and lost coin um, are combined into one story. 
So like a shepherd lost his coin? No, 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 no. They just a tell sheep, like... A sheep lost a widow? <laughs> a sheep lost a widow. No, uh, a sheep lost a coin. It's so <laughs> weird. <laughs> no, um, in the Bible, it's, you know, like each story, the way that these Bibles are written, it's just like one story after another. And so it's like the lost sheep, lost coin are just like combined into one yeah. section. Yeah, that's good. Um, And so I guess just... Because they go together, yeah. and we got one for the men and one for the ladies. <laughs> yeah, it's fun because they're kind of like shorts, you know, like um, not short pants, but short mm-hmm. films. Uh, <laughs> like they're 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 short stories, and then with the third, Jesus kind of breaks it down, right? Um, but it makes them that much more kind of digestible, which I think is neat. Mm-hmm. Um, I also love like there's some research about and like people who actually shepherd get how dumb sheep are yes like this is a this is apparently a thing <laughs> i've seen babe that <laughs> this is the thing that i that i've had to learn about sheep uh in in biblical studies but it always comes up uh that if you know if you're a farmer and you've ever had sheep you know that they are idiots uh <laughs> and can really really easily get lost um and it's funny that like that's the first analogy that jesus used it's also like the most common analogy in the bible for like biblical Israel or the people of God mm. is uh, we are sheeple <laughs> like <laughs> in need of a shepherd. Uh, and uh, there's a really funny video of uh, a sheep getting rescued out of a ditch. Have I you love, seen this one? I love this video. And the sheep gets rescued out of the ditch, leaps for joy, and leaps right back into the ditch. <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> sheep are idiots. Yes. Uh, I've always seen that with the caption of, like, God rescuing me from my problems. Like, yes. <laughs> out of the problem and right into the next one. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I think I, I think that's part of that's part of the parable. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's interesting that I think the par- these parables, they're, they're not about the sheep or the coin. They're about the shepherd and the woman. Right. Uh, and, uh, again, that's another, uh, another example of the Bible being not actually about us, but about God. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um, do you have other, I wonder questions or things that bother you about these stories? Um, I think the thing that bothers me is, <laughs> we talked about a little bit of evangelism, but like the woman finds the coin and mm. then throws a party. Parties ain't free, fam. Like, yeah. <laughs> So, like, did she spend the coin on party decorations? <laughs> That's a fun, I wonder. Yeah. Uh, in, in this triptych of parables, um, the party is the refrain. Right. So, like, that's part of kind of what went into writing the song. And that's why, like, the verses are slow and sad. Uh-huh. And then the the hook is, like, a hootenanny. Like, because uh, that's the way the, the story reads. Yeah. Um, and it, you're right. It is an unreasonable party. Yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, in, in both like no shepherd uh, who's in their right mind uh, would throw a party f- just because he found a sheep. Yeah. Uh, nor would a woman have any reason to throw a party because she found a coin or nor would you to if you found your glasses. But <laughs> that's the hyperbole in the story that. Uh, no, that's the kind of stuff that this God gets excited about. Yeah. Uh, is absolutely I'm going to throw a party over this one sinner who repents. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and uh, and I think like the other implication is that God has resources for the party beyond the sheep and the coin. Yes. Uh, uh, in God's uh, insurmountable or inconceivable riches, uh, those resources are dedicated towards partying (laughs) yeah have you ever lost something and and then like when you found it like straight up rejoiced that you found it i'm sure i can't think of anything in particular but uh i know the relief of finding finding keys or my phone oh that's a good one (laughs) yeah (laughs) like it borders the relief of waking up from a bad dream and realizing the bad dream is not real yes you know like that's that's an endorphin rush that I can understand people wanting to wanting to manufacture. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the that that feeling of finding something that I really do need mm-hmm. uh, is something I can kind of relate to. What about you? Yeah, I'm thinking about this one time um, I directed a play, and this one woman she um, she had like all of these necklaces or whatever that she let us use, and so um, she brought them in a bag and. 
at the end, you know, we were striking the set and it was just chaos. And so the bag with the necklaces got like put in a big bucket of props and just hauled off. And I had just started the job here. So I was like directing with community theater, just started the job here. And so my house was a mess. My life was a mess. These necklaces went missing. I had no idea where they went. And she didn't really push the issue until they were getting ready to move. And she called me and she's like, hey, you took those necklaces. Do you know where they are? I really need them before we move. And I was like, oh, yeah. And I could not find them. Like, I tore my house apart. Like, went and looked in the storage unit. Like, everything. And it was like the day I was supposed to take them to her. I still had not found them. And I was like, did they get thrown away? Because I remember, like, the bag they were in. And we had recently, like been cleaning out this like one room in our house we call it narnia because we just shut the door and like nobody really knows what's going on there and so like i was like i could i threw it away i'm gonna have to go to this woman and like reimburse her for all these things and i just remember i stopped and i prayed i was like god you have got to help me find these necklaces like just show me where to go show me what to do and i felt this just like in my spirit that was like you need to go look in this one like Like, move this one box in your closet. And I was like, and so it just like, it kept nagging at me. Like, I hadn't moved this one box. So I moved this box out. And then in a hamper in the bottom of this closet was the bag of necklaces. Wow. And I, like, I called, I called my husband. I called my (laughs) mom. I called everybody. I was like, y'all are not going to believe what just happened. (laughs) I love that. So, yes, I've been there. That's great. If I could have thrown a party, I think I did like take myself out for a milkshake after that because I was like. <laughs> I love that. I earned this. Actually, apparently Jesus led you to the necklace. <laughs> he did. Jesus Jesus is the one you should buy a drink for. Yeah. Uh, that's great. It was a Chick-fil-A milkshake. Oh. So there you go. Yeah. That's Jesus's favorite, isn't it? <laughs> it is. Yeah. I, uh, in the mini evangelism episode, you, uh, well, Abigail exposed the fact that I had forgotten the context of the parables. Yes. Uh, and <laughs> she and, ate you alive, man. Yeah, it happens. <laughs> it's, I, it's been a week and it's only the beginning of the week. Uh, so, uh, but I'm glad that you brought up the tax collectors bit like mm-hmm. that, that, that because of Abigail's question, we, we got that on the table cause that helps set the context for why Jesus is telling the story. Um, What's uh, what's your take on tax collectors? Okay. I'm going to get real with y'all. Bring it. I feel really uncomfortable in the current state of... Um, there is a certain facet of evangelis- evangelicalism or whatever that um, loves money. Mm. And... They use church as a as a profitable business. Yeah. And I know that that's a lot of reasons why a lot of people are leaving the church, mm-hmm. right? Especially just like American evangelicals, like it's 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 a money thing, it's a business. I'm I've gotten like really into watching the Righteous Gemstones, which please do not judge me if you were listening to this because it is not a Christian show. <laughs> um, but it's it's kind of about that, like yeah. you know this this family that they've. They make this really wealthy life mm-hmm. off of like profiting off of money that's given to the church. And so when Jesus is aligning himself with people who are betraying their their faith and their people and taking money off the side, it makes me uncomfortable. Yeah. That makes you a, that makes you a Pharisee. Yes. Yeah. Oh, Jesus, I'll wear it. I'll wear it. Jesus, <laughs> why are you eating with those shitty evangelicals? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I just want to, you know, I... I'm like, I I am much more comfortable with him, like, having dinner with prostitutes than I am with him having dinner with people that, like, take money. Yeah, and I think uh, that's why when we read these parables, uh, it's important to figure, to to make our own cast of characters. Yes. You know, uh, the, the people, we, one way to do it is to say, oh, you Pharisees, you're just being jerks. Tax collectors aren't all that bad. The other is to say, okay, who are the tax collectors that I don't want Jesus to love? Yeah. Uh, who who are the people that I think are undeserving of Jesus's love and attention? Yes. Uh, that if uh, if I saw them being welcomed to the communion table, I'd have a real problem with it. 
Um, well, they're already at the communion table. They're setting the communion table in my mind. And I'm like, I don't like this, man. You know what I mean? And so it's like, you know, when you like turn to the Bible to like, oh, this is such an indictment on myself. Turning to the Bible to like judge other people. Yeah. And we talked about this last week with the Good Samaritan, right? About how like a lot of times like persecution within the faith is mm-hmm. coming from other Christians. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm like, yeah, Jesus wouldn't like that. And then I open this up and I'm like, well, oh, man. Yeah, he's eating with tax collectors. (laughs) And that's, I mean, I think that's what the parables uh, do. Like part of it is Jesus is casting this sheep as the the tax collector that's in need of being found. Mm -hmm. uh, That Jesus is perfectly willing to recklessly go find. Mm -hmm. Uh, Same with the coin that, like in in the analogy or in the parable, the coin is the one that uh, other people would say, just let him go. Right. Like, forget about them. You got 99 sheep right here. Got 99 or, sheep. Right yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and part of what happens in reading the parable is not only is Jesus willing to go after them, but it turns out I'm one of them. Like, I, I am just as lost as that sheep. Like, the, the Jesus has this way of when we're judging somebody – putting us right next to them Mm -hmm. and forcing us to see that, Oh, actually. Yeah. I'm, uh, it's another sense in which like the phone is coming from within the house. Yeah. uh, Yeah. That, uh, I, I'm actually no more deserving of the place at the table than a tax collector. Uh, um, even if, even just by judging the tax collector that, that brings the hammer of the law right back down on me. Mm -hmm. Um, I think actually the, the parable of the prodigal son does an even more, even better job of that. Oh, don't. Uh, but that's for another episode. Uh, <laughs> that's for when I start having beef with my brother again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, I. It's funny. So we're at we're at a Methodist church, um, and part of Methodist history is figuring out how we want to do communion. Yeah. And ultimately, we have an open table, which means you don't have to be a member of this church or any church to come and receive. Uh, oh, and I love that. Right. Um, I have been in churches before that I've been told you need to make sure you get your heart right before you come to the communion table and you cannot have any sin in your heart before. You, like if you have sin in your heart, you can't take communion. And I'm like, I don't think anybody in here yeah. is eligible for that. And I remember just being like, a kid and just like praying so hard to make sure that I did not sin between the time I asked for forgiveness and the time I brought the bread to my lips. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, uh, and like there's scripture to back that up. And if you push that far enough, you realize like there's no getting out from under that. Like there's yeah. no point at which I know for sure that I'm worthy of coming to this table. Mm-hmm. Um, we do, uh, do a corporate confession and absolution of sin beforehand. Yes. And uh, ceremonially, and I think literally, that does it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but part of the issue with churches that might reserve and say you can only come to the table in certain conditions uh, is to misread the parable. Mm-hmm. Uh, to Because in the parable, again, the sheep, the coin, they don't have to do anything. And part of what we're saying that has happening at communion is not – that we are coming and finding Jesus. It's that Jesus has come and found us and says, this is where I want you to be at this table. Right. Um, but in Methodist history, there's a really funny kind of juicy gossip story that you may or may not know. Oh, no. When John Wesley, who's known as the founder of Methodism, came to uh, the States. Boy, I'm from Savannah. I know this story. You know the story? <laughs> Sophia Hopke was this woman that he fancied. Uh, and they saw each other for a little while, um, and she made it clear that uh, she was no longer interested. Oh. And your boy denied her communion. <laughs> and her fiance. Yeah. That's how she made it known that she didn't want. She went and straight up got engaged to somebody else. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, so that's part of why it's been part of Methodist like doctrine and debate is we have this kind of like unfortunate story about our founder who was petty enough to deny somebody communion. Uh, but I also think that's instructive because as long as you're, as long as you feel like you have authority to draw that line, mm-hmm. you're going to draw it based on your own judgments. Uh, not your, 
you're not going to be able to just hold the line, whatever line God might have. Uh, in fact, in this parable, in Jesus' life, in the death and resurrection, God continues to erase those lines yeah. or uh, or just step across them, yeah. um, which is where, like, there's a saying I don't know who's attributed to, but anytime we draw a line in the sand, Jesus is the one standing on the other side of it. Uh, that that's that's how Jesus works. <laughs> is anytime you draw a line, Jesus will reveal himself on the other side of it. Uh, Jesus is always identifying with the tax collectors and sinners, um, and the people we don't like, and the Samaritans, and so on and so forth. Uh, that's hard, man. Yeah. That's that's just really hard. Yeah, and so it, part of the double meaning of the parable is yes, we are the lost one, and Jesus is coming to find us, and also. The people we can't stand are also the lost ones that Jesus is loving and uh, and insisting on finding. Like you don't get to decide which sheep are worth saving. I don't like that. No, I mean because <laughs> I, uh, uh, yeah, I agree. Um, also, I just want to point out that that church where he uh, denied communion, they are now all about like, oh yeah, this is John Wesley's church. Oh my God, I bet you were. <laughs> we all know. What yeah, they probably. Bro- sweep that story under the rug, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's part of it's part of our story. Yeah. So does that make me a fair sheep? Yeah, and I think I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, who's your Who's your um, tax collector? Um. So, I'm not going to say I'm fully sanctified or anything like that. Uh, okay. We know. But the the longer I listen to Jesus, the fewer of them I have. Because uh, my honest answer is, who's my tax collector? It's me. Uh, <laughs> what? Like, they can't hear your face. Good. <laughs> I think there, like, there are definitely people. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Certainly not in in our ch- own church. Um, yeah, I, I guess I, I, if you push me, I can come up with folks, but uh, it's not. I think that uh, some of that judgment is actually something that Jesus has freed me from. That's the reason why you wear the robe on Sunday morning. I guess. And I don't. I guess. I mean, I, I'm not. I, I think that's my testimony. It's not like it's not my resume. Uh, but who were your tax collectors? Oh, uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry, those of you who identify this way, but like all conservatives, mm. all rich people, most white people, um, you're, you're, yeah, you're white. I know. That's why I said most <laughs> white people. Uh, I think there was a time when I felt like I was because I'm a Christian, I'm a warrior, mm. uh, and um, and that's that. It's it's been rendered more complicated over time, mm-hmm. and. Uh, I also think there was a time when that kind of judgment was to keep my mind and heart off myself. Mm. Uh, like I, and I think that's a thing. Like we get Pharisaic about other people as a coping mechanism for our own shortcomings. Like that's mm-hmm. that's definitely a thing. I think my ta- another part of my tax collector is self righteous pastors that think that they're just better than everybody <laughs> on podcast. I don't think that uh, <laughs> I. I what I'm what I mean to say is that I think this is a thing that Jesus helps people with. Yeah. Um, and uh in in some ways I still have just as much room for growth as anybody else. And in some ways I really am different mm-hmm. than I was. And it's uh and I ascribe that to Jesus. Yeah. Um and having received grace myself i've grown in my capacity to offer grace for others Mm -hmm. uh and i think that's if i if i had to kind of summarize what the spiritual life or the christian life what kind of transformation happens that's the one that i value the most right um that uh that it's i think it's part and parcel of these parables as well as the parable of the good samaritan that um seeing that that i'm in the ditch with everybody else yeah or I'm just as lost as anybody else. Yeah, you ain't a part of the 99. Right. That that actually helps uh, 
grow my capacity for compassion or empathy or patience um, with the others. Um, But see, what sucks is now that I've said this, you're going to be able to hold this over my head a long, for a long time. Anytime you hear me, I was like, and you're just going to be like, oh, but I thought we were just gracious to all the people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, yes. okay. I'll take it. I'm going out of town for the next two days, so you're good. <laughs> you're not going to have to see me at work. <laughs> yeah. That was way more answer than I thought I would give. Uh, so what about you? Who, who are the tax collectors? I already told you who my tax collectors were. self right Me. Is what you said. Yeah. So. No, I said people that people that use the church as a profit center. Yeah. Literal tax collectors. Sure. Tithe collectors. You know what I mean? But like that, I'm not saying that like people shouldn't collect tithe or offering or anything in their church. It's those that guilt people into giving to fund a certain lifestyle that is not Christ-like. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's the discomfort in the story for me. Yeah is just so many people now associate Christians with that, with right. people that like to flaunt opulent lifestyles with the money that's supposed to be intended for God. And so for Jesus to identify with people that are taking advantage of people's money, like that's just where I feel really uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. I feel that too. I probably feel that, uh, the, the same thing in different ways. Uh, but it's interesting too, cause I, I identify with the sense of like Christians that give us bad PR, like that, that make people think that this is what we're actually about. That yes. we're actually hypocrites. Um, the problem is, uh, I think we all are hypocrites. <laughs> and so, oh, yeah. so it's not that I want people to think that Christians are better. It's that I want Christians to publicly be, aware that we're not better (laughs) yeah and i think that's too it's like something that i think i double down on my judgment because i am not a good example sometimes Mm. you know what i mean yeah like i i will pop my mouth off in in certain you've heard me do it right I, (laughs) i will pop my mouth off and say things that are very not um kind or clean or anything like that but you know but then, like, I'll get on my whole, like, I'll see a news story about the fall of a certain pastor, and yeah. then I'll just, I will get, like, right up there on my high horse and be yeah. like, mm, yeah. what a shame, you I, know? <laughs> yeah. I think, and generally, I think that that's just kind of normal. That's kind of, that's kind of where we live, and that's why we have church every week, uh, <laughs> you know, because yeah. probably can't go more than six or seven days without needing to be reminded of, uh, of our simultaneous lostness and foundness. Yeah. Well, and you know, you mentioned John Wesley. Um, you had mentioned something in the Methodism 101 class about how he um, like kept a diary of his sins. Yeah. Like he tried that thing of keeping a diary of his sins. Right. And it's like I'm absolutely terrified to do that. Yeah. I don't. I don't want to read that book. Right. I, and let me rephrase. I don't want to put that on paper. Right. I was always taught like if you're gonna do something bad, like don't write about it in a text message. Don't leave a paper trail. <laughs> right. And part like part of what he realized is he's not going to be able to document himself out of the tax collectors club. Right. Like it, it, it can't, it can't really be done. Mm-hmm. Um, you can't, you can't actually like climb a sheep can't actually find its way to its shepherd. Yeah. Uh, a shepherd has to come find the sheep. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the sheep has to be willing to follow. Um, but, uh, but it's not something we can, we can crawl our way out. And that's why Jesus kind of it just consistently subverts that whole dynamic yeah. in the stories he tells and the things he does. Yeah. I want to shift gears a little bit. Yep. Because there was something, an I wonder question that Abigail had, which kind of seems silly, but then I started thinking about it and I'm like, oh no, this is interesting. Um, is what did the shepherd do with the 99 sheep when he walked away? And so I've been thinking about like the 99 Right? Let's say we are. Sometimes we are in the 99. There are people that are probably listening to this that are in the 99. Okay. (laughs) Right? Like, how did they all stay together? And, like, why did he leave them? He walked away from them. Like, why did he walk away from those 99? Because Abigail um, 
she did not ask this on the recording. She asked this later. She was like, how did they not all, like, how did he not then have to just go find 99 other sheep? Like, how they all just wander off, you know? Like, what do you, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's part of the scandal of the story is he's not that good of a shepherd. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, that, no, like, no shepherd in their right mind would leave 99 sheep to go find one because you're putting the 99 at risk. Mm -hmm. But apparently this shepherd knows that they're not putting the 99 at risk or is willing to risk it for a time. Mm -hmm. uh, and so like part of the question is, what does that say about God? Is it that God has the 99 covered by means we don't understand that a normal shepherd wouldn't? Or is it that, no, God is actually willing to risk a lot in order to find this one? Uh, and I think the truth is probably somewhere in between there. Mm -hmm. Another thought that I've had is uh, each of those 99 sheep is one sheep. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know how they stick together. I guarantee you sometimes they get lost, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, and only the overflowing heart of God could have that same regard for the, each of the 99 that God has for this one. Um, that's it's miraculous. Uh, mm -hmm. it's mysterious. Um, but I also think it's a fair, I wonder question, because I wonder like, what does it feel like to be, to think you're in the 99 and to feel left right. by the one who was supposed to be your shepherd? Right. I think people have that feeling. Um, and, and that's real. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's, it's definitely a fair one, but part of, part of the logic of the story is that somehow this shepherd can have the same allegiance, care, shepherding heart for all hundred sheep um, and in ways that kind of defy our understanding. Right. I think that my thoughts on it are either. Um, I don't think shepherds were out there alone. Mm. And even though Jesus doesn't bring it up, I'm wondering if, like, if, if I were listening to it in its original context, if I knew that shepherds weren't out there alone. So that one shepherd left the 99, like I'm listening to it and I'm like, oh, the 99 were already in the care of someone else. And I think about like, remember last week during the, or last episode during the Good Samaritan, we talked about how the, the church is the innkeeper, right? The church is this like unnamed shepherd yeah, that's left behind to take care of the 99 while this one shepherd's going to go and look mm -hmm. for the other um for the for the one lost sheep. Yeah. Or let's say he was the only shepherd out there. Um, we recently had an event at our church that um, when we were talking about it, I was like a church picnic. And so like everybody was together and the word that just kept coming up was community, right? Like everybody had a friend <laughs> and there were people that I did not know but it was like hard for me to introduce myself because they were engaged with somebody else in the church. You know what I mean? Like it was just this like beautiful sense of everybody was together and they felt safe. Like parents felt safe to just leave their kids in a different part of the field because they knew that their kids were safe. And it's these 99 together. When we are, when we are a unit, a flock together, then nobody's going to wander off mm. and everybody's going to stay strong. And if one does wander off we're still together we've got it under control you can go and take care of that and find that one because we've got it under control over here yeah and then eventually when you bring that one back they're just folded right back into the flock um that was kind of like my interpretation yeah. on it i love that i love that yeah i also feel like the the sensation of the 99 might it might be pretty similar to the sensation of the lost one like where's my shepherd yeah uh and part of being in the 99 might mean that you don't have that feeling alone. Yeah. Uh, that everybody's looking for the shepherd. Mm -hmm. And and maybe part of having faith as the 99 is um, we're going to wait together until the shepherd shows up. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and like you said, not, not have to be alone. Because um, I think like when I think about the lostness uh, of the parable, um, you know, I think in some sense, people these days actually probably do experience that a lot, um, existentially, like mm -hmm. spiritually, um, mm -hmm. 
because uh like belief in god or a higher power is something that in our culture it's not a given it's contested uh and i think part of faith and a faith community um is the sensation of having people who will wait with you in the lostness until god shows up yeah um uh so perhaps the the 99 after the the sheep returns uh say oh we're at, we're actually going to make sure you don't get lost again <laughs> you know <laughs> uh that uh or or the church after the resurrection says uh oh uh, we we are actually going to make sure that um especially when nobody knows what the shepherd is that we are together mm-hmm. um i think that that's part of what i've seen in the in the people of our church is yeah. like this is a place where you cannot believe with us yeah <laughs> or you can you can feel lost and have unanswered prayers and really kind of be done with this whole thing and uh and we'll stay with you mm-hmm. i talked to a couple this weekend um they're fairly new to our church and um they've been coming for like maybe like two years and um the I'd asked them like what brought them here to our church and everything and um they were just talking about how much you know they just love the community and so I was asking them more about their family and they told me they had a daughter who didn't go to church um but uh she used to but now she doesn't because there's just a lot of hurt there Mm -hmm. right and a lot of um rejection sure essentially by the church and the mother said to me she was like you know I know God is going to bring her to church. And I feel like it's going to be this community, but even if it's just like to any church, I know that God is going to to bring her home. Um all I can do is love her and wait for her here. And it's almost like she they were keeping a place for, her, yeah. <laughs> you know. And um and I just loved this mother. You know, she wasn't like, well, she's on her own. You know what I mean? Like she's still, she'll send her like clips from sermons or like notes or invite her to a Zoom something. You know what I mean? Like, but you know, it was just, I just loved that. Like, we're just going to put this in God's hands now yeah. and God's going to take care of it. And God's not going to stop looking. And yeah. We'll be here in the pen. Yeah. <laughs> getting get the party ready. Yeah. Getting the party ready. Another thing I like about the coin um, because we can talk about sheep and shepherds all day. But the one thing I like about the coin is that the woman, um, she finds the coin by cleaning house. Yeah. <laughs> she gets rid of all the mess. Oh, that's really good. You know what I mean? And I just think sometimes when I'm lost, God not only finds me, but he has also cleaned up my mess. I like that. I like that. Yeah, because when we put ourselves in the, in the shoes of the woman, uh, seeking something that we cannot find... You know, there's a U2 song that comes to mind. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. Um, It makes me think of, I saw, I follow some Orthodox priests, like Eastern Orthodox priests on social media. And like, I love like three quarters of the stuff they say. And then they say something that's just like nuts. I'm like, that's why I'm not Orthodox. But but one of them was being, was asked the question, do the Orthodox believe in um, in like salvation by grace or salvation by works. So like, do you have to do something in order to be saved? Um, or are you, are you saved just by grace through faith? Um, and what was great about the Orthodox answer, answer, it was, was, it was complicated. Uh, the priest basically said there's, of course, there's nothing we can do to be saved. Uh, and part of how we're saved is through faith starting to let go of things to make room in our hearts for grace to live there. Uh, and that's immediately what I thought of when you talked about this, this woman sleeping the house is like part of getting to that coin or getting to that, um, treasure to forecast, you know, another parable that's coming up. Uh, part of it is, um, is letting go of or sweeping up the stuff that is not that thing. Yeah. Uh, which is is tough, um, but if you if you really know what that thing is, it's it makes it easier to to sweep the house. Like yes, you know if because uh, she she knew the value of that coin, mm-hmm. uh, and there was nothing going to stand in her way of 
being reunited with that coin. Yeah. I love that. Great, great insight. Yes. Yeah. I got him. I finally got one. Yeah. <laughs> also, too, it just makes me think of when I lose most of the time things get lost in our house when we have just given up yeah. on cleanliness and tidiness and there's just stuff everywhere, right? Yeah. And then we lose something and that's when we begin the rage clean, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I know I got to get this house clean in order. You know, it's like the mess has now caused the loss. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that I think about when I'm like with parenting glasses on or a parenting hat on yeah. is when my kids lose something. Uh, I noticed how much I value the thing that they lost. Because yeah. uh, I, I will either be like, yeah, sorry, you should have put it away where mm -hmm. it belongs. Or you lost that. You have no idea how much money I spent on that or like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, but like my kids are, uh, they also like, it's funny what they will, what they will actually look for and what they won't. Yeah. Uh, like some things that I think are quite valuable now they're kind of done with it. They don't care where it is, but like they're raggedy, stinky, lovey that they sleep with. Uh -huh. If we can't find that before bedtime. We can't go to bed. Yeah, there is no bedtime. Right, right. <laughs> uh, and that's that's the thing that they have that much love for and need for and value of. Yeah. Uh, I did not realize that I um, valued something um, until a few weeks ago. And we can joke about it now because time has passed. <laughs> but my daughter had lost something that she needed for school. And I was determined to find it. And it became very valuable it was like a piece of cardboard on some string like it was not important but it was important at that moment and my husband who i love so dearly said two words to me would you like to know what those two words yeah. were? what what do you think those two words were oh i have no idea it was more than two words but maybe we should calm down oh and then it became 10 times more valuable <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I did not realize how valuable it was until I was told, until it was pointed out to me, like how stressed out I was about this. You know yeah. what I mean? So, I yeah. love that um, because I think that's um, that kind of rage hunting. Yeah. You know, of <laughs> I'm going to find this thing, damn it. Because, because, uh, um, and don't tell me to calm down. Or yeah. the same kind of oh, that thing was that we. such a nicer thing. That's the really, that's what I should have said. Oh. <laughs> Don't tell him to calm down. Instead, I told him to go do something to himself, but it's fine. <laughs> um, or even the kind of distress that we see in our children when they can't find their most prized possession. Mm -hmm. What this story is saying is that how God, that's how God feels about you. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's who Jesus is. Is uh, Don't tell me who to eat dinner with. Yeah. Yeah. Don't tell me to calm down. Uh, I've come to seek out and save the lost and nobody's going to get in my way. Uh, and you better hope that I will feel the same way about you someday, Mr. Pharisee. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I think that's when we catch the real meaning of the parable is when this is um, an ir irrational overcoming desire to find the lost. Yeah. That's uh, God is uh, a foolish shepherd and a crazy woman. Yeah. 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 So how are you going to talk to your kids about this? I think, um, I wonder if I will talk about this story the next time uh, we've lost something in the house. Oh, I'm sure that'll go over really well with your oldest. Yeah. She's going to love it. She's going to love to sit down and talk to you about that. <laughs> <laughs> I also wonder, I don't know if I'll have the courage to do it, but um, we we do have times when one of our kids will get in an emotional space that where they're really kind of beside themselves yeah. and um, and freaked out and overwhelmed. And I think that's when I want to remember the story mm -hmm. and uh, and maybe even like say a prayer out loud. Yeah. It's not something I really do because, again, I'm so kind of – it's just – it can feel cringy to, to, actually, say to actually say a prayer out loud with my kids uh, other than like a dinner prayer or something like that. But yeah. to like stop and say, dear God, like – that's it's a level of spiritual intimacy that is hard for me. Yeah. Uh, but if I have courage, I think that that might be 
a gift I can give both my kid and me to be able to say like in that moment when what's wrong, I don't know. I just don't feel right. I'm crying. I'm mad at everything. If I can actually say, dear God, this kid, we're, we are kind of lost and we don't know what's going on mm -hmm. and we want you to come find us. Right. Um, I don't know if I'll have courage to get that kind of vulnerable uh, with my kid, but uh, I think that that's, that's the invitation I'm taking away from our conversation. I think it's because we, we do that. Like sometimes we'll just yeah. kind of stop and be like, I got, I got to stop praying about this. Yeah. <laughs> but that was something that was kind of instilled in me by my parents was your problem is not too big or too small for God. Mm. So even if you lost the necklaces that you need to return to this yeah. girl that's about to move, or even if you've lost the cardboard fish, or even if you've lost, or, you know, even if you're just not feeling right, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? God's going to listen to that prayer. And even if, even if you don't immediately find it, even if you don't, um, you know, all your problems disappear, like that's not happening. Yeah. It's kind of the same way of, you know, people tell you to just stop and count to 10 or take deep breaths. Like, I mean, if you're going to be breathing out anyway, you might as well be sending up a prayer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, and it yeah. just kind of helps you remember, like, there's, there's somebody else on your side who's mm -hmm. looking with you. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for you when you, like we said in yeah. many evangelism, when you lose your mind, <laughs> yeah, they're going to help you find it. <laughs> and, who's, and who's not going to stop? Yeah. I yeah. love that. Good. Yeah. I think when I'm talking to my kids about it too, like just, yeah, like he's, he's going to throw a party. Like he loves you so much right. that even if you walk away, there is a party waiting. There right. is a party and we love a party. Yeah, we do. Do you love a party? Every time. Every time. <laughs> That's why I really do think we should throw a party for your sunglasses. I think that'd be great. That would be so good. There are actually, okay, no joke. There are a pair of sunglasses somewhere in this church that I lost. And they were like really nice sunglasses that I bought myself. I went Christmas shopping. So I rewarded myself for buying all the Christmas presents by buying me something too. And I lost them at the chili cook-off. Mm. No, 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 no. The town hall meeting. That's months ago. I know. And I still haven't found them. So if you find, did you take my sunglasses? I did not take your sunglasses. I promise. All right, well, if you find a really cute pair of black Kate Spade sunglasses, they're mine. <laughs> I, will, I will start popping bottles and throwing confetti as soon as, as, soon as we do. Hooray. <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. Uh, we look forward to uh, being with you again sometime soon. Uh, a reminder that if you've got questions, reactions, or insights that we haven't caught, you should email us at what's our email? Minivangelism at gmail.com. And you can also get to us through Instagram and our handle is? At Minivangelism. And uh, you could also show up to our church and ask a question. We're Grace United Methodist Church in Manassas, Virginia. And we'd love to see you. Yeah. All right. And you can uh, come take communion. You can. Even I will if, not stop you. Even if you don't like us. Even like, <laughs> yeah, this one ex-girlfriend, if she walks in. No, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Uh, God bless you and uh, enjoy the good news that there is uh, a God in the world that is seeking and finding you and your kids um, and the tax collectors and the sinners. And the fair sheep. And the fair sheep. Amen. All right. Bye. Bye. Many Evangelism and the Driver's Seat are hosted by Anna Burrell and Drew Colby. Theme song written by David Burrell and produced by Evan Setzer. The theme song was performed by David Burrell, Drew Colby, and Evan Setzer. Podcast, sound design, and editing done by David Burrell. Many Evangelism in the Driver's Seat are a ministry of Grace United Methodist Church in Manassas, Virginia. For more information, check out umcgrace.org.